Hello class, welcome to our presentation of an introduction to eDiscovery. Throughout this presentation, there are two goals. One, we'll learn the substantive material related to eDiscovery and how it relates to technology in the law firm. And two, for attendance purposes, you will be listening carefully for five special codes that will be announced throughout the presentation. This is much like webinars and CLEs provided by the New Jersey State Bar Association. In order to get credit to these CLEs, we have to listen to codes and then report back. You'll be doing the same. So listen for your five special codes, make note of them, and then you'll submit them through the submission link on Blackboard. Let's get started. We have a lot to accomplish during this module. After this module, you should be able to do the following. Describe the term discovery and explain its purposes in litigation. We'll also examine the federal rules and how they have changed to address electronically stored information. We'll describe the procedures and time periods for discovery under the federal rules. Take special note of the meet and confer rule, what is its purpose and the expected outcomes. We'll also look at the rules that govern what information is discoverable and of course what isn't. We'll look at the purpose of a litigation hold and the duty to preserve evidence. And we'll end with looking at spoilation and its significance and the possible sanctions for spoilation of evidence. But before we do all of that, let's review some discovery basics. Let's define what is discovery. In most contested cases, it's a good idea to ask for discovery. It's the term for the organized exchange of information between the parties. And of course, successful discovery allows for familiarity with the rules of the court. And of course, the rules relating to electronic files are becoming increasingly important. Make a little note here. It was December of 2006 that e-discovery rules were added to the Federal Rules of Civil Procedure. This was the first time that the feds recognized that we have electronic discovery that needs to be accounted for during the discovery process. But don't worry, we'll get to more on e-discovery here in a minute. But let's go back to basics. What's the purpose of discovery? When you're exchanging the information, even though engaging in discovery can add to the expense of the case, learning about the other side's case and being forced to reveal one's own case increases the likelihood of a settlement. Think about it. Since both sides can have a better idea of what facts each side will try to prove at trial, each can now weigh how strong or weak their case is relative to the other party's case. Further, discovery is very helpful because it makes trial less of a game of blind man's bluff and more of a fair contest with the basic issues and facts disclosed to the fullest practical extent. So we're going to be in a better position to evaluate our chances of success at trial and also based on the perceived credibility of witnesses and the weight of evidence. Throughout your legal career, you will engage in many different forms of discovery, but I'd like to quickly review or introduce, depending on where you are in the legal program, the different types of discovery. There's several different types, but these are going to be the most common that you'll see. Interrogatories, requests for admissions, requests for production, and then of course, depositions. Let's start very briefly with interrogatories. Interrogatories are written questions that may be asked of the other party with responses required to be in writing and under oath. Take a little note of that. These are responses that are going to be in writing and under oath. This is helpful because these answers can then be used as evidence by the other party at trial. Now there are standard interrogatories that are defined by the court rules, but these standard interrogatories, they're going to ask for information about say the identity of an expert and a lay witness, the briefest synopsis of expected testimony of these individuals, and then also any exhibits that the other side might uh, be presenting that are relevant to issues in the case. So in a nutshell, interrogatories written and they're answered under oath. Let's go with request for admissions. Requests for admissions require the other party to admit or deny specific facts or to admit or deny the authenticity of documents. It's often helpful to have the authenticity of documents admitted prior to trial 
so that we can determine whether to call witnesses to actually authenticate these documents. What's helpful for a request for admissions is that there's no limit on the number of requests for admissions that can be made on the authenticity of documents. Also, these documents produced by one party can be used by the other party at trial. Well, how about request for production? Requests for production, these are designed to allow one party to seek documents from the other party. The other party is required to make available for copying documents that are in his or her possession, custody, or control. So even documents that are not in a party's possession, but they're within our control, uh, say, for example, banking records or medical records, uh, we have to make these available for copying. And sometimes the way that these records will be made available is per, by providing the party requesting the documents a release that allows the party to obtain the records from a third party. So request for production, you're looking to getting relevant documents. Lastly, let's take a look at depositions. Depositions allow a party to have any witness, including the opposing party, answer questions orally and under oath. Again, highlight that. They're like interrogatories, but we're answering them orally and they're under oath. Depositions are tricky because one must pay for a court reporter for attending the deposition and also transcribing the deposition itself. And we have to pay for the attorney to prepare and attend the deposition. Depositions are incredibly expensive. We will typically reserve these for cases in which there are substantial disputes and the parties have sufficient funds to take them. But they're very helpful. Uh, they're ideal for learning details about, say, a witness's knowledge of the disputed facts, pinning down the witness, and also determining the limits of the witness's knowledge so that the witness cannot present more damaging testimony at trial without looking like a liar or seeing if we can get useful admission from that witness. Also, I find depositions to be very helpful because they can be used to impeach a witness. I can show that they're lying, that they're biased, or that they overstated uh, his or her knowledge. Also, depositions are helpful because if we have our own witness who might not be available at the time of trial, this might be because of where the witness lives, uh, that they might be moving out of state, or say that they're in poor health. So depositions of witnesses who are considered unavailable at the time of trial they can be used in lieu of their appearing at trial. Well, when looking at the different types of discovery, I want you to start thinking now of how heavy and how uh, many documents and how much evidence can come through with discovery. This is gonna present an, an issue for us when we're looking at electronic discovery. Well, very briefly, as we're looking at the review of discovery, you might be thinking to yourself, well, it sounds like almost everything is discoverable, that we have to exchange everything in a case. Uh, that's a good rule of thumb to follow. The general rule is that anything that may lead to relevant evidence uh, is discoverable. Uh, it doesn't actually have to be discoverable itself, but that it can actually, or that it's relevant, but it can lead it to relevant evidence. So the scope of information that can be obtained through the discovery process is going to be a lot broader than what can actually be admissible at trial. So we have to look to see, was there a relationship to evidence about the litigation and is it likely to lead to admissible evidence? Uh, remember, admissible evidence means evidence that's going to be allowed in at trial. Take a special note of this rule here, the Federal Rules of Civil Procedure, Rule 26A. This makes mandatory the disclosure of certain basic information supporting a party's claims. We're gonna have to produce, regardless of whether it's requested, everything that the legal team intends to rely upon to prove its claims. Again, that goes back to what I just noted, identity of witnesses, expert witnesses, lay witnesses, copies of documents, um, if it's an insurance issue, computation of damages and insurance. That is all relevant and under Rule 26A, we have to disclose it even if it is not asked for. 
Here's a good time for us to reveal one of our secret codes. Your first code is 7145. The first code is 7145. Well, how long does discovery go for? The federal rules provide a timeline with a set of obligations that we must follow. I don't want you to get too stuck into the actual timeline itself, the amount of days and things like that. That's better suited for your civil litigation class that you'll take. But rather, I want you to stay very broad and look at what's happening in discovery. We start the process with an attorney conference, and then we're going to meet with the judge. The goal with discovery is we cannot begin it until the lawyers have conferred and they develop a proposed discovery plan. So the attorneys have to meet first, and I'll discuss that here in just a few minutes. Well, you have to be thinking to yourself, how does this relate then to what we're doing? We're a technology class that sounds a lot like civil litigation. Well, it is, or well, not even just civil litigation, but litigation in general. It goes back to electronic discovery. With the development of technology, much like we discussed at the start of the course, we are seeing a lot of evidence now coming through email, text messages, photographs, uh, applications on your phone, Snapchat, Twitter, the list goes on. And all of this is discoverable. That's the technological aspect of this. So take a look here of how the feds describe e-discovery. It's the identification, location, retrieval, preservation, there we go, preservation, review and production of electronic documents and information in regulatory and civil discovery. And the policies and procedures for records management, information technology, and corporate compliance to support the process and minimize its risks. So we're looking at two things. We've got to identify the electronic documents. And again, you'll see here that documents aren't just documents as you might think of that, but very broad. Anything electronic is going to fall under e-discovery. But also, what are the proper ways to re record and manage this technology? So in other words, when you hear e-discovery, you're thinking electronically stored information, ESI. Anything that's relevant to a particular case that's electronic, it's still going to fall under discovery. So here's the different types of electronic data and documents. Now, when I think of documents, I, of course, think of the very first bullet, word processing files. That's the easy one. But look at how this gets into a little bit of nitty gritty. You go from email to your calendar, spreadsheets, your accounting records, voicemails, video mails, internet, financial, uh, personal records, chat rooms even. Then it gets even more specific. Uh, your mainframes, your LANs, your servers, desktop, home computers, your laptops, printers, telecom, intranet, Blackberries, on and on and on. In other words, this is about to get crazy and it's about to get expensive. Or some might put that together and say, it's about to get crazy expensive because all of this is discoverable in litigation. So let's now get even more specific to our class. We have a nice foundation of what discovery is. You have in your mind, it's the exchange of documents, but wait a minute, she just introduced electronically stored information. So now we're looking at the e-discovery basics. What are we going to do with all of the electronic things that can be discoverable? Now, of course, electronic discovery is no different than traditional discovery. It's the result of an investigation or lawsuit. But we know that discovery, you know, really the early 1990s, it was mostly done in paper. Your documents were all in paper printed out. Um, but documents now, they're more than paper. Uh, the data volume is huge, and it's going to grow steadily. Think in the back of your mind, email. Open up your email account right now and look at how many emails you have. It's the best example I can give you. Also, the process is a lot more expensive dealing with electronic discovery than dealing with paper. And 
it becomes much more complex. When you add in the technology aspect, this is going to create a bigger risk to the client. And not only will it create a big risk to the client, but also the attorney if they don't know how to handle dealing with the technology through e-discovery. Well, where does New Jersey stand on this? Take a note of this case. It's the State v. Miller case. Hey, 2011. It was 2011 that New Jersey finally made a statement related to e-discovery. Didn't you just learn a few slides back that it was 2006 that the feds finally acknowledged? So we're a few years behind. But here, our Chief Justice in the State v. Miller case says the following. As advances in modern technology make their way into the courtroom, the judiciary, like the rest of society, must adapt. So you're already thinking, New Jersey, they're going to put the burden on the attorneys, on the legal staff, you as paralegals, that we must adapt to the changing times. So it's on us to ensure that we understand the process and how to handle it when we're in litigation. No excuses. So here are some court rules. I don't want you to get too lost in New Jersey court rules. I provide these for you so you can see that we're now addressing. Again, in this class, we walk a fine line when we discuss discovery because a lot of this is uh, litigation that you learn in another class. So I want you to focus on the technology aspect a bit more, but these provide a nice foundation. Uh, we see here that one rule allows for electronically stored information by subpoena. Also, uh, in a civil trial, anything's electronically stored information is discoverable. We see in Rule 3 here, 13-3 in criminal, and Rule 7, 7-6, municipal court, they provide for the ability to inspect and copy ESI, and we can request it in any form, um, which must be translated into a usable form. And also, ESI, it can allow for interrogatories and notice to produce uh, this production of documents that I just described to you. So you can see here through the rules that New Jersey now is adding that ESI language. That's the key. Well, how about the federal rules of civil procedure? Let's go back to that. 2006, if there's one year that you need to know, that's it. This was when the electronic discovery rules were finally adopted by the Federal Rules of Civil Procedure. Basically, the feds were dealing with this issue. There's a question as to whether the rules adequately accommodated e-data. Because e-data, it went from being the unusual case to the norm. I can even speak to this in my own uh, practice. Uh, remember, I shared with you when I first began practicing law, the attorney that uh, I worked with when I was in law school, he brought his laptop into the courtroom. and No one really understood why he was doing that or what was the purpose. It was very unusual that he was using a laptop. Now everyone has their laptops. We have our phones. We have our, our iPads, anything technology. And because we're doing more work on the technology, uh, technology platform, this is going to increase that e-data. And the volume of data makes discovery a lot more burdensome, and it's costly, and it's time-consuming. Take a look here. A floppy disk, remember those? They hold 1.44 megabytes. That's about 720 typewritten pages. A CD, on the other hand, holds 650 megabytes. That's about 325,000 typewritten pages. So we see that your local rules, like I just mentioned for New Jersey, uh, they're being drafted in an attempt to fill the void of what the federal rules did not address. So the federal rules were very broad, basically say it's discoverable as long as it's not privileged. And uh, your local rules, they're going to fill in anything that's not as specific. Well, you're probably thinking to yourself, uh, Professor, give us an example of why this is so important. This is all coming to light post-Enron Arthur Anderson heir. Now, 
this might be um, very familiar to you if you have experience in accounting, uh, if you work for a firm that uh, does, say, a lot of business transactional work, uh, or uh, perhaps you've seen the movie. But I need for you to know what Enron was. Uh, the Enron scandal, it was publicized in 2001. It eventually led to the bankruptcy of the Enron Corporation. Uh, Enron was an American energy company. It was located out in Texas. And from the Enron era, it also led to the de facto dissolution of Arthur Anderson, which was one of the five largest audit and accounting partnerships in the world. So in addition to being the largest bankruptcy reorganization in American history uh, at that time, Enron was also cited as the biggest audit failure of all time. So Enron is the energy company. Arthur Anderson is the accounting firm. Well, Enron, it was uh, formed in the mid-1980s, I believe 1985 or so, uh, by Kenneth Lay. That might be a name that's familiar with you. Uh, merged with Houston Natural Gas and Enter North. And uh, several years later, Jeffrey Skeen came on board they developed a staff of executives um, that used a lot of special loopholes in accounting and special purpose entities and poor financial reporting. Basically, what they were doing was they were hiding billions of dollars of debt from failed deals and projects. Uh, the CFO, uh, Andrew Fasto, and other executives not only misled Enron's board of directors uh, on high-risk accounting practices, but they also pressured Arthur Anderson, the accounting firm, to ignore the issues completely. So you can start to see how this is going to become a major issue. You have a company, they're hiding billions of dollars in debt and losses, and they're telling their accounting firm to ignore it and not keep track of it. Well, fast forward, here's what's about to happen. Enron's shareholders, they get wind that things just weren't right. Uh, some stockholders wanted, were wanting to sell and uh, could not sell their shares. Well, the shareholders, they filed a $40 billion lawsuit after the company's stock price, which had achieved at a time a US uh, dollar amount of $90.75 per share in the mid 2000s, it plummeted to less than a dollar by the end of November 2001. So in layman's terms, if you were explaining this to uh, your family at dinner, uh, they say, hey, what happened to Enron? Your shareholders wanted to start to sell some stock. They were getting wind that something wasn't quite right with the company. Uh, the stock in one day, when it used to be valued at $90 and some change, plummeted to a dollar, less than a dollar a share. Money lost, and your shareholders are losing a ton of money. So whenever that happens, that just doesn't happen randomly that, that a company loses that much money. Uh, the U.S. Uh, Securities and Exchange Commissions, the SEC, they come in and they begin the investigation. And Enron ultimately ended up filing for Chapter 11 bankruptcy. Um, basically, the 630 I think it was like $63.4 billion in assets, um, it made it the largest corporate bankruptcy in U.S. history until WorldCom that happened the next year. Well, how does this relate to what we're doing? Many of the executives at Enron, they were indicted for a variety of charges. Some were later sentenced to prison. Anderson was found guilty of illegally destroying documents that were relevant to the SEC investigation, uh, which awarded its license to audit public companies and effectively closed to Arthur Anderson. And by the time uh, the ruling ultimately was overturned at the U United States Supreme Court, the company had lost the majority of its customers and had completely uh, ceased operating. Uh, Enron employees and shareholders, they received limited returns 
uh, despite losing billions in stock prices, but also in pensions as well. Uh, as a consequence of the scandal, a lot of new regulations went into place, uh, particularly financial reporting for public companies. Uh, one, point, one piece of legislation was the Sarbanes-Oxley Act. Uh, that goes for my accounting students. Uh, but the Sarbanes-Oxley Act, this increased penalties for destroying or altering or fabricating records in federal investigations or for attempting to defraud shareholders. Uh, also, the act increased the accountability of auditing firms to remain unbiased and independent of their clients. So Enron was huge, $63 billion bankruptcy. You have an accounting firm, Arthur Anderson, who is destroying documents. Uh, if you've seen, say, the Wolf on Wall Street movie, and there's a scene where they have a huge shredding party, uh, think that's what's happening at Enron. Documents are getting shredded. Well, in the bankruptcy and the litigation, take a minute to consider how much discovery was going on. Email alone that needed to be discovered. Data consisted of 92% of Enron staff emails. So in order to start discovery, they had to get their hands on it, about 92% of emails alone. Also, with scanned documents, over 150,000 documents needed to be provided to the SEC during the investigation. And transcripts alone of depositions, over 40 related to the case. That was just the tip of the iceberg. But what was happening while Enron was being investigated was documents were being destroyed, which you'll learn here in a minute that that is completely now illegal and not allowed. Also, after that exciting discussion of Enron, now's a good time for our second code. Your second secret code is 8957. Your second secret code is 8957. So why is e-discovery so complicated? Uh, we got to produce a lot of documents. Uh, and instead of reviewing boxes of paper, we have new e-discovery tools that have emerged. That's what you're learning through your modules this week. Also, what makes it so complicated is the attorney document review. Essentially, what we are required to do is when we get a request for documents, we have to go through and pull out any privileged documents, anything that's protected, that's confidential, that is not allowed to be discoverable. So that can make discovery, again, much more burdensome and time consuming. We're not handling, handing over every email. We can pull out anything that's technically privileged. So why should we care? We know it's complicated. It, you're getting the image of thousands of emails, thousands of images, thousands of text messages that are going back and forth. Uh, so much, the volume is so high. But really, why should we care? Take a look at the sanctions that are falling on these companies. PricewaterhouseCoopers, one of the biggest auditing and accounting firms in the world, here's a penalty for delaying and resisting discovery orders in a case they were involved in. 345 million dollars. JP Morgan, penalty for losing emails demanded by the government, 2.1 million. Morgan Stanley, they bungled their e-discovery collection, which then equated to an adverse inference of guilt and a default judgment. They lost the case and resulted in a 1.45 billion dollar sanction. UBS Warburg, Penalty for deletion of emails. Doesn't sound all that bad. Sure it does. They got an adverse inference instruction to the jury, which basically means uh, there's a presumption of guilt, and a $29.3 million penalty. Qualcomm failed to produce relevant documents. They sat on them. They refused. Well, they got hit with an $8.5 million sanction. And Prudential, one of my favorites, they were very ineffective for communication of the preservation order, which again led to adverse inference instructions to the jury and a $1 million fine. 
So it's not just the millions and billions of dollars in fines that these companies are getting hit with, but also the adverse inference of guilt and in the instructions to the to the court. And in the Morgan Stanley case, a default judgment ruled against them. They lost. The sanctions are huge. That's why we care. Let's get even more specific. You'll see that throughout the presentation, we've started broad. Hey, what's discovery? Then we got even more specific looking at e-discovery. Now let's start to look at what's going on within the discovery process. The meet and confer. Put a big star by this. This is huge when it comes to discovery process. The meet and confer is just like it sounds. This is a step required before the scheduling conference with the assigned judge. The scheduling conference, it's going to occur within 90 days after we enter our appearance by the attorney who represents the defendant. So 90 days by the time we enter our appearance, we're going to meet with the judge. But before then, we got to have a meet and confer. And this has to occur at least 21 days before the scheduling conference with the judge. So basically, it allows 99 days for the meet and confer session. Well, what occurs with the meet and confer conference? The goal of a meet and confer is to promote an open and forthright information and sharing dialogue, both internally and externally. Also, it allows for training if we need it, if our firm uh, is not equipped to deal with e-discovery, it allows for us to be trained in it, and it allows us for, to develop and bring in practical tools so we can create this cooperative, collaborative, and transparent discovery. Also, and this language is right from the Rule 26A, the federal rules, is that during the meet and confer conference, the attorneys, what we do is we discuss the nature of the claim and whether or not we think that there's a likelihood of settlement. We also at that time arrange for mandatory disclosures and we develop a discovery plan if one is necessary. Essentially what's gonna happen is the attorneys, they'll meet either face-to-face -face or a lot of times we'll do it right over the telephone I'll call opposing counsel. We'll have our quick meet and confer. We'll say, "Look, uh, is there any chance of discover? Uh, is there any chance of settlement?" Uh, no, this doesn't seem like a case that's going to settle. I don't think my client will. That's fine. Then let's go ahead and establish our deadlines. How much time do you need for mandatory disclosure? Okay, I need 30 days. Maybe opposing counsel needs 45. We come to a compromise. We'll also establish a discovery plan. We'll agree to all of this. And during the discussion, we're also going to not just look at timelines, but we'll look at, well, how are we going to preserve the electronic evidence? What is going to be the scope? Is there privileged or confidential documents? We'll address issues of chain of custody. Again, the timelines will be important, but also production uh, format. If you're asking yourself how complex are the meet and confer conferences, it's all relative to how complex the case is. Uh, when I do uh, divorce cases in family law, if it's a very straightforward case, but I know we're not going to be able to settle, I know we're going to trial, um, and uh, I know that uh, my clients are going to come to an agreement, I'll call opposing counsel, basically say, look, let's have our meet and confer, we'll do it over the telephone, how much time do you need for discovery? I probably need 45 days. Sounds good. Here's our discovery plan. We then, um, one of us agrees to type it up and uh, sends it to the other to sign it and they'll submit it to the court. Usually the meet and confer conference on a very straight case like that takes about 15 minutes. The more complex cases that are out there, think again of you know your major financial firms that we just highlighted. When they're having their meet and confer conferences, these could take days, uh, if not weeks, because they're trying to establish all of these important objectives. So complex case, more complex meet and confer. After the meet and confer conference, just like I mentioned, a written statement uh, that will memorialize the items discussed must be submitted to the court within 14 days. Most of us have a, a template for an agreement that we've come to. Uh, 
one of us volunteers to type it up. The other will send it to the court. We sign it and off we go. The judge does not like to get involved with meet and confers. Uh, we leave, they leave it to the attorneys to figure out unless they must intervene if we can't come to an agreement. I have always found it to be very effective to hash out the agreement in the meet and confer so you keep the judge out of it and it starts the litigation uh, on as much of a positive note as we can. Or, and I should say not only a positive note, but a collaborative note as well. Well, it's going to fall back on the attorneys. Let's take a look at money and competency. At the end of the day, we all know that practicing law is what? A business. And we are there and we are concerned uh, about running a business by representing our clients. And also when the representation of clients comes to mind, we want to keep our fees low. Remember, it's against the rules to rack up fees for the sake of racking up fees. But we know that discovery is expensive. I'm going to show you some highlights here of a study that was done a few years ago from the American College of Trial Lawyers. These are folks that are doing litigation day in and day out. And they did a joint study to look at the expenses that are associated with discovery and how they're having substantial adverse effects on the civil justice system. Uh, it's a serious concern. Uh, basically, um, we want to have discovery because we avoid surprises. Uh, we streamline our trials. However, uh, many are concerned that extensive and burdensome discovery jeopardizes the goal of rule one of the federal rules, which is to adopt procedures that will lead to a just, speeding, and inexpensive determination of every action and proceeding. And you say to yourself, Callaway, put it in layman's terms, easy. E-discovery is expensive, but the rules say you got to keep litigation inexpensive. So how are we going to balance the two? Well, it's in time for repair. From the study, take a look. Although the civil justice system is not broken, it's in need of repair. The survey showed that the system is not working. It takes too long and it costs too much. Also, the study found the discovery system is broken. It costs too much and it's become an end in itself. Take a look at some of what the respondents uh, in this study stated. The discovery rules in particular are impractical and they promote full discovery as a value above almost everything else. So here we go. We have the discovery rules saying, keep the litigation inexpensive, but at the same time, the rules are saying to us, you have to release everything. Everything is discoverable. And also the survey found that judges should take a more active control in litigation from the beginning. When the abuses occur, judges are perceived to be less than effective. So maybe judges should be involved in the meet and confer. Maybe the judges should have a bit more of an influence from the start of a case in order to keep cost down and to keep discovery be from becoming out of hand. Well, take a look here. The OFEHO, this is in a famous case the Fannie Mae case. Um, I think we all can remember what was going on in 2008, 2009, the bubble burst. Um, in this particular case, Fannie Mae securities litigation, how much discovery was going on? The OFHEO had to hire 50 contract attorneys to solely abide by a stipulated order for discovery. The total amount spent on the individual defendant's discovery request eventually reached over $6 million. That was more than 9% of the agency's entire annual budget. And folks, that was just on discovery itself. That was not the entire litigation. Okay, Discovery does not mean entire litigation. That's not your attorney fees, court fees, so on and so forth. $6 million in discovery alone. 9% of the entire 
budget to deal with the Fannie Mae case. It's expensive. But who's to blame? You might be thinking to yourself, well, we have a bit of, of an issue going on here. We're expected to comply with discovery rules. Um, they're telling us to turn over everything, but we know that to turn over everything is going to be very expensive. Well, here's the issue. Non-technical knowledge equates to inability to competently represent the client and also the inability to cooperate with opposing counsel. It should come as no surprise to you that whenever there's an e-discovery issue or a malpractice case, who are the courts going to defer to? They defer to the client and the blame will be put on the attorney. ABA Model Rules of Professional Conduct Rule 1.1, which every state follows, including the state of New Jersey, says the following. A lawyer should provide competent representation to a client. Competent representation requires the legal knowledge, skill, thoroughness, and preparation reasonably necessary for the representation. It is not an excuse for an attorney to say they didn't know anything about e-discovery or they didn't know how it worked. We are considered incompetent if we try to pull that, and it's a violation of the rules of professional conduct. In other words, it's not going to fly. There is an expectation that we know what we are doing. So when the fees get higher, there's also this link that, wait a minute, the fees are getting too high, discovery is becoming too costly. Is it because the case is really that complex, or is it because your attorneys don't know what they're doing? Which is why you're here, so you can learn what we're doing. Now's a good time for our third secret code. Stay with me, folks. We're getting to, to the end. Our third secret code is 3330. Third secret code, 3330. Perk up and pay attention. Litigation holds in spoilation. The rise, okay, let's focus on litigation hold. The rise in the number of electronic documents has drastically increased the volume and scope of e-discovery. I can't stress that enough, but just take a look at your cell phone right now. How many pictures do you have on it? Text messages, emails, guess what? All of that is discoverable in a case, all of it. Remember when we're where we started, that it doesn't necessarily have to be relevant, but as long as the evidence leads to admissible evidence, it's discoverable. So now we have an issue. You think you're going to get sued, and if you think you're going to get sued, more than likely you are going to get sued. And uh, what are we going to do with all those documents? We want to put in place a litigation hold. The new federal rules of civil procedure, they address three concerns when you're looking at e-discovery. We want to look at preserving the electronic materials, producing them, and destruction. So how do we preserve, how do we produce, and how do we destroy, or when can we destroy? Take a look at litigation hold with emails. Email and your Word documents they can number into the thousands, if not more. Because these documents can be subject of a discovery in a potential lawsuit, we have to advise our client on establishing retention policies. In other words, when we put the litigation hold in place, basically we're just advising our clients on how long they can keep these documents. If you think you're gonna get sued post Enron air, you cannot destroy anything. That's the rule of thumb. So if a client is concerned about a potential lawsuit, uh, what they can do is they can easily destroy evidence contained in their electronic files. Um, I have, have worked on cases before where unfortunately someone might have a text message that uh, is uh, damning to their case uh, or might have an email. And uh, basically what I say to them is if it's out there, you cannot destroy it. The very first thing we want to do if we think we're going to be sued is destroy evidence that's going to harm uh, or damn our case in any way. Well, we're not allowed to do that. Once a client has a reasonable belief, write that down, bold it, highlight it. Once our client has a reasonable belief that litigation is going to arise, they have a duty to preserve 
all documents, emphasis on all, anything, paper and electronic that relates to the case. Now, the courts, they really, uh, the feds have said it's up to each court to determine what constitutes reasonable belief, but it's much like this. Uh, if you think you're going to be sued, even the thought you're thinking that you might be, well, why are you having that thought? More than likely you are then. If it's on your mind, you're probably going to get sued. Uh, it's much like if you smell a skunk, uh, the skunk is near, nearby. You're just not quite sure when you're going to see it, and you hope you don't see it. But uh, if it smells like a skunk, uh, then it's going to be a skunk. So it's our duty then, if we have any suspicion that we're about to be sued, uh, that we preserve any information that we know or should have known uh, that there was a possibility of litigation. And how we do this is we present to our client a litigation hold letter. Take a look here. This is a sample preservation letter. Uh, same thing, litigation hold, preservation letter, it's the same thing. Uh, basically, in this document, uh, we are telling our client that everything, everything must be preserved. Don't delete it. And take a look at the language. Take some time to read this. This includes, but is not limited to, email, electronic communication, word processing documents, spreadsheets, databases, calendars, telephone logs, contact manager information, internet usage files, network, so on and so forth. Then it gets into the, the actual hardware itself, your databases, your networks, your computer systems, disks, drives, tapes, personal computers, hey, mobile telephones, handheld wireless devices, paging devices, so on and so forth. Then we got to include employees must take reasonable steps to preserve this information. That's easy. Don't delete anything. Don't delete and don't destroy because failure to do so can result in extreme penalties. Go back to that slide with uh, Morgan Stanley and the rest of those uh, firms that have received those high sanctions. Those are the penalties that are coming out, millions of dollars. When you're looking at this letter and you're trying to explain it to a client and they're saying, well, what, what does this mean litigation hold? It doesn't matter if you're working on say a divorce case, a, a business uh, contract dispute or anything of that nature. We're gonna simply explain to the client you're being sued. Anything that is relevant to this case is discoverable. You cannot destroy it. You cannot delete your Facebook account. You can become inactive, but don't delete it. You can't delete anything off your cell phone. You cannot delete uh, anything uh, off your emails. You cannot destroy even paper documents. Nothing. And we usually will give a specific time frame. Um, it depends, again, on how fast we're going to get into court, whether it's a six-month uh, period, a year period, everything must be preserved. When I was teaching this uh, particular topic a few years ago, it was completely ironic um, that the day that I was to present about litigation hold uh, letters to my class that the university, Rowan University, um, was under investigation. They were being sued. Uh, it was a claim based on discrimination by a student. And that morning, a litigation hold letter went out to everyone at the university, everyone, from your facilities folks all the way to your administrators and the faculty in between. And the letter looked a lot like this. It said, we're under investigation. There's a possibility of litigation. No one is to delete any information. You cannot delete any files from computers. You could not delete any emails. We will let you know when the litigation hold is lifted. And it was about 90 days later that we received a follow-up letter, uh, email that said, now it's okay to destroy emails. Um, and here's the thing, is that the majority of the people that this letter was sent to had no idea about the case, had no involvement in it. However, it was a possibility that perhaps an email that I had sent could have in some way related to this litigation 
or led to admissible evidence. Uh, and in that case, it would be destruction of evidence had I uh, deleted an email. Now, long story short, it ended up that the claim was baseless. The university was fine. Everything went back to normal. But that's how your litigation hold works. Uh, I would also describe it as putting on a freeze. Everything gets frozen. We're not touching anything. Well, what happens if you do touch it and you destroy? Uh, make a special note of this language. You want to be using the language spoilation. Spoilation refers to destruction of evidence as it pertains to litigation. And folks, it can involve almost any method of destroying evidence. Um, I'm thinking, oh, you delete an email or you rip up a picture uh, or you uh, take a hammer to your hard drive. It could also involve crushing of a motor vehicle that had damage showing the cause of accident. So spoilation it can be any uh, way to destroy evidence that relates to litigation. Here's where we make mistakes. Take a note here. Do not ever tell a client to clean up or delete their social media accounts. For example, Facebook or Snapchat, Twitter, Instagram, Pinterest, whatever else is out there. The client can deactivate it and I would advise them, uh, in most cases, to not get on social media. They should stop immediately once they're in litigation. Uh, if you're being sued, don't get on social media. Uh, but you cannot delete it. You can deactivate, but you cannot delete. Uh, if the client does go in and they clean up or they delete things, that's spoilation. That's going to cause a big problem. Well, what happens? Naturally, you're thinking to yourself, we have a client, they destroy evidence. They don't listen to us, and they won't. You tell them, don't get on Facebook, don't delete your account. What do we do? We are not allowed to help hide the client's mistake. We cannot lie for them. They delete Facebook, we have to tell the court that they deleted it. They destroy electronically stored information, we have to tell the court. Well, that's intentional spoilation. What happens then if uh, we accidentally uh, destroy evidence or there's routine maintenance? Uh, Rule 423-6 does preclude imposition of sanctions when the failure to provide ESI was caused by the loss of a um, routine good faith operation of the ESI. So say it is a scheduled routine maintenance, uh, like the college does it like every couple of weeks to Blackboard. And when they do their updates, sometimes we might lose something. Well, I don't have control over that. Uh, that's routine. It's good faith. Uh, I, I'm not going to be sanctioned for destroying evidence there. Uh, so if it's good faith, we can work around that. But if it's intentional, that's spoilation and we'll be sanctioned for it. Well, how are we going to be sanctioned? Again, go back to that slide with all the firms that uh, we discussed a few minutes ago. Court imposed against the party who destroyed it. It can range from additional discovery to the monetary penalties. And not only that, the additional discovery and monetary penalties, we can almost handle that. What I'm more afraid of is the adverse inference, inference instruction to the jury. Take a look at the Zimmerman case here. This is out of New Jersey. If an adversary has intentionally hidden or destroyed evidence necessary to a party's cause of action, the party seeking that evidence is entitled to the adverse inference that the evidence would have been unfavorable to the party responsible for the evidence, and they can amend the complaint to add fraudulent concealment or may seek discovery sanctions. You're at your dinner table tonight and your family says, what in the world does that Zimmerman language mean? That's a lot of mumbo jumbo. Easy. We're, basically, the court is allowed to say to the jury, they would not, the evidence was destroyed. They would not have destroyed it unless it was bad. Now, again, 
why would you have destroyed it if it if it wasn't bad? Uh, you don't want the jury to hear that. Uh, it's incredibly unfavorable, and uh, that is a jury instruction that they will hear. That you're allowed to think that. I wouldn't want anyone thinking that that I destroyed something because it could have been bad. Well, uh, we're getting near the end. How about privilege, attorney-client privilege? Uh, privilege review, make sure you know this language. It's basically the process of reviewing the documents to identify anything uh, that is privileged, confidential, or your attorney work pro product. Uh, we're going to remove anything that is privileged from the documents. Uh, the excluded documents, mark this down, they're identified in a privilege log. It's essentially a list, and we can create that list in Excel. Uh, that states the basis for the claim of privilege. Now, documents that are considered privileged uh, can still be overlooked and produced unintentionally. Uh, that's tough. Uh, this is referred to as an inadvertent disclosure. This is when we inadvertently disclose something. Well, when that happens, the federal rules put in what we call a clawback provision. Basically, the call clawback privilege uh, provision says that you put it out there, you need it back, so you claw it back. Uh, I imagine a cat with claws, they're trying to get it back as quickly as possible. You inadvertently did it, I need it back. So that is allowed. Uh, let's see here. When we're dealing with privilege, uh, we can always come to an agreement with the opposing side. What do we do if something has been inadvertently disclosed? Also, we need to, we have the burden if we're claiming privilege by explaining why there's privilege, does it actually exist? And uh, we then identify it on that log. It's not always possible that we handle uh, documents appropriately as much as we try. Again, the more documents you have, the more likely there's going to be an inadvertent disclosure. So what we have to put in place is that discovery plan that identifies how you deal with the clawback. Uh, that clawback or non-waiver, again, it allows the party to recover the privilege or confidential material if it's been inadvertently disclosed. Um, it's a safety device. It's, it's, that's all it is. Here's the thing, though. If it's out there and you have a clawback agreement, you get it back, but the opposing has already seen it, you have to agree that they're not going to use it uh, against you in some way. But uh, it's very hard to take our eyes away from something that we, we've already seen. So that's why we have to be very careful when we're dealing with e-discovery. Go through those emails carefully, make sure nothing gets turned over that should not be turned over. Uh, this is another good time for our secret code. We're on secret code number four. Secret code number four is 2949. Secret code number four is 2949. One more to go and then we're finished. Highlight this rule 505, privilege reviews. Uh, this allows for at least in federal court protection when there is disclosure that's inadvertent. You got to say, well, what were the reasonable steps taken to avoid inadvertent protection? Also, the action is taken promptly to correct the inadvertent production and that there is an existence of the clawback agreement. The feds say you have to have the clawback agreement in place. Otherwise, there is uh, no, uh, no right to, it, to being privileged. It's fair game. Uh, so let me give you a quick example. You accidentally turn over an email that was privileged. You immediately call opposing counsel and say this email got sent over. It should not have been produced. We have an agreement. Please delete it or return it if it was sent um, on a disk or a drive or anything like that. Uh, per our agreement, please return it. Most folks are going to play fair because, again, the more... Uh, that's discoverable, the more likely there's going to be some human error, uh, but we try our very best not to have that happen. And here's the thing, if you don't play nice uh, and you say, well, I'm not going to return it, well, I can almost guarantee you that you'll make a mistake in the future and uh, do on to others as you'd have done to you, as the old saying goes. Uh, if you didn't want to play ball, 
opposing is not going to play ball with you. It will come back to bite you. I've always have uh, stood by uh, my principle that in discovery, play fair. We never want to be known as uh, litigators who don't play fair or, or develop that type of reputation. Uh, law is collaborative. It takes um, everyone working together to have a successful trial. There is no need to hide the ball or to play games uh, because, again, it's going to come back to bite you. Uh, if you're thinking to yourself, wow, this is really exciting, uh, e-discovery, I would love to sit and look through thousands of emails uh, to find relevant uh, evidence for a litigation. Well, then why don't you get a document review job? Uh, document review, it is one of the most costly parts of discovery. Imagine you're going through all of the business documents, trying to process them, search them, and review them. If you remember the movie Clueless, I cannot believe I am bringing up the movie Clueless in our class, but there is a scene where Cher, the main character, her father is a litigator. They're sitting at the dining room table and they're going through, I believe it's uh, transcripts from a deposition and she has to highlight a certain date. Well, that's what she's doing is document review and then a few scenes later, it's discovered she highlighted the wrong date. Uh, document review now, it can still be like that going through papers, uh, but now we're going through electronic documents. It can be done really efficiently by converting everything into a common format. And Rule 34 says that the requesting party, as long as it's reasonable, uh, they can request the desired format for the delivery of information. Oh, real quick, when it comes to document review, I said if you wanted a job, you can do this. Um, there are firms in Philadelphia, uh, I believe there might be a firm in Cherry Hill as well, but I usually get the Philadelphia notices, that will have document review uh, projects that they will hire you for. Uh, sometimes they want a recent law school graduate, sometimes they will take paralegals. You get paid about 15 bucks an hour to sit in a room, much like our classroom. You're in front of a computer the whole day and uh, you are searching and documenting uh, certain dates, certain information um, through uh, in a discovery case for litigation. It sounds just as exciting as it is. Uh, it's And usually these projects last for about a month or so. Uh, in fact, there was one that was just advertised uh, on Indeed in which uh, a firm in Philadelphia needed document reviewers for a month long project. It was a huge litigation case. Again, about 15 bucks an hour. You sit there for nine hours a day uh, going through documents. Uh, it's a great way that if you need some legal experience, uh, to, if you can get picked for one of these projects to do. Uh, and also a lot of uh, law school graduates who may not have passed the bar, so they're not licensed to practice law. Uh, if they don't have a job, they will get these document review jobs uh, to fill the gap before they get licensed or before they're hired for a firm. So just FYI, keep a lookout. They come through uh, all the time on your job websites, LinkedIn, uh, Indeed, post a lot of these uh, if it interests you. So we will end on a fun example here. Your home state, New Jersey, Bridgegate. If you don't know what it is, Google it real fast. Um, but New Jersey is $161 billion in debt, uh, which means that uh, we would have to pay $52,000 each to get us back into black. Uh, this equates to 537 Bruce Springsteen's to erase. Well, go back to Bridgegate e-discovery on the George Washington Lane closing scandal, $2.3 million. So where did the money go to investigate this? Look at that, $2.3 million just on e-discovery alone. Here's some of your cost. Data hosting, almost a million dollars, $934,590. You could go right through this list and you could see the unit cost, how many units, and the total cost. PDF generator, $33,000. 
per, well, uh, less than two cents a page, $33,000 to PDF generate. Uh, compact discs, $35 each. We had to buy four of them, $140. Take a look there, just over a million dollars in e-discovery cost alone. We were spending, spending, spending. The fees incurred were over a two-year period. Most of these e-discovery invoices only surface the legal proceedings. Uh, keep in mind that this is actually going to come after the work was performed, so it will reflect only the historic market rates. Uh, in that over a million dollar fee, that did not cost include costs for travel, postage, software, other service fees. Uh, some of the fees itself, they were client adjusted, meaning they were examined, accepted. Uh, we got to argue that they were reasonable. So during discovery, not only are we trying to establish a case, uh, going through everything, preparing for litigation, but we also look at the accounting aspect of it as well. We're keeping track of all the fees that are related to e-discovery uh, because guess what? They will be charged to the client at the end of the day. Folks, thank you for joining me for our introduction to e-discovery. I have covered with you, and I've lost track of time, but probably in an hour or so, of uh, what discovery is, how it relates to e-discovery, and I've highlighted for you the most important aspects. What does a litigation hold letter do? What is spoilation of evidence? What's a privilege law? If I can leave you with this, e-discovery is very complicated. It is very burdensome. Uh, in fact, because we are becoming such a society that relies so heavily on discovery, a lot of times now in law schools, they are teaching e-discovery as a semester-long class. Um, so I was able in a less than an hour give you an overview of this process. I don't want you leaving though thinking it is that simple. It's not. It's actually much more complicated. If I could, I would spend the entire summer getting into the nitty gritty with you on e-discovery, although I think I would probably be a lot more excited about it uh, than you are. Uh, as always, reach out to me with any questions or concerns. Uh, highlight the important things I told you to highlight. Make sure you review those because you will definitely see those again on the final exam. And I will lead you, leave you with our fifth and final code. It is 4269. 4269 is our final secret code. Make sure now that you go onto Blackboard, you submit the codes through the submission link under the appropriate module. And if you have any issues doing so, just let me know and uh, I will see you in class. Thanks everyone. Goodbye.